Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to do another story time and makeup. And today's story is going to be about a woman named Jane Tappan who had many different aliases. One was Jolly Jane and the other one was the Angel of Death. So we're going to go ahead and begin our story on Jane Tappan. Jane Tappan was born Adora Kelly in March of 1854. She was the daughter of Irish immigrants Bridget Kelly, who died of tuberculosis when Jane was very young, and Peter Kelly, who was well known as an eccentric and abusive alcoholic. In later years, he became the source of many local rumors concerning his supposed insanity. The most popular is when he sewed his eyelid shut while working as a tailor. In 1860, just a few months after her mother, Bridget, had passed away, Jane's father took his two youngest children, her, herself, and her sister, Delia, to the Boston Female Asylum, which was an orphanage for um, poor children. This was due to the fact that he himself was being admitted into an insane asylum. Documents for the asylum note that the girls were rescued from a terrible home. There aren't many records um, that discuss a whole lot about their experience while they were in this orphanage. However, less than two years after her father had dropped her and her sister off, Jane was placed as a servant girl in the um, Toppin household. Jane later changed her first and last name from Anara Kelly to Jane Toppin. The Toppin family um, wanted to Americanize her name a little bit more, so that is why um, her name was changed and she also wanted to take the surname of the so-called adoptive family that she was now with. Even though I don't think they officially adopted her, I have, um, I've read accounts of both that they did adopt her but then on other accounts that they didn't adopt her. So I'm not quite sure whether or not she was officially adopted but she did take the surname of um, her we'll call it adoptive family. In the care of her new parents, Jane excelled in school, but things were not well between her and her new mother. Anne was a very strict woman and treated Jane like she was just a servant. She never really treated her like she, a mother would treat a child. The Toppin family had a daughter named Elizabeth, and Jane and Elizabeth got along pretty well, even though Elizabeth would often remind Jane of her place within the family, which was that of being beneath her. She wasn't really, like, part of the family. She was beneath them. When Anne Toppin died, Elizabeth took over the home and continue to treat Jane as a servant. Even though her and Jane got along very well, she did treat, still treat her like a servant. However, she treated her much nicer than her mother Anne did. Elizabeth ended up marrying a church deacon and he moved into the Tappan house. And um, it, I don't know what caused this, but Jane moved out and I don't know if there was like a strain in the family or an argument or what it didn't really say why she moved out it just said that Jane had moved out so at that time Jane had moved out of the home and began nursing school in Boston Massachusetts nursing school was nothing like it is today while they had to train for two years which is the same as a nurse would nowadays um, their training was hands-on. The young women lived together and um, worked seven days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day. And each nurse would care for about 50 patients. They would be paid about $7 a week for this. Some of the work that they had to do was pretty grueling. They had to um, cook meals, scrub floors, stuff like that, but Jane had no problem with this. She actually um, seemed to thrive in this type of environment. And more than likely, that's just stemmed from the fact that that's what she did when she lived with her foster family or adoptive family. She was treated as a servant, so servant work wasn't really a big of a deal to her. At the hospital, Jane was very well liked. Um, she had a very upbeat personality, was always smiling, 
And that is when she was given the nickname Jolly Jane because she always had this happy, jolly um, demeanor about her. Just as nurses today have a large knowledge of prescription drugs, <clears throat> nurses back in the 1880s also had to have extensive knowledge on medications used at the time. In order to get her nursing degree after two years, Jane had to be tested on her knowledge of these um, medications such as morphine and atropine. She had to know um, the correct doses of morphine to give to um, patients such as children and as well as what to do in case an overdose was given. Once Toppin became close to her patients, she picked her favorite ones. The patients were normally elderly and very, very sick. She learned how to keep her favorite patients bedridden and totally dependent upon her by using them as guinea pigs in experiments with morphine and atropine. It would alter their prescription drugs to see what they would do to their nervous systems or see how they would react to the patient's nervous system. While morphine would slow a patient's heart rate, the atropine would increase it and cause severe convulsions. At times she would administer these cocktails and bring her patients on the brink of death and then worked furiously to save them. She was proud of herself for doing this and liked to show off her nursing skills in this manner, making herself out to be an extraordinary nurse. In reality, she was a complete psycho. She spent a considerable amount of time alone with her patients, making up fake medical charts, medicating them to drift in and out of consciousness, and even sometimes getting in bed with them. One patient by the name of Amelia Finney, in an operation back in 1887, afterwards, she said that Jane Toppin gave her a dose of medication causing her to lose consciousness. Um, Jane then climbed in bed with her and began kissing her face like all over. She just kept giving her kisses all over her face. Um, and then something startled Jane and she stopped. The next morning, Finney decided it was all a dream. Like she just had a really weird dream. 14 years later, when Jane was arrested, Finney realized that that might not have been a dream at all. At the time she began her nursing career at the Massachusetts General Hospital, she was so efficient in the use of these two drugs, morphine and atramine, that she began killing her patients. Eventually, rumors had started coming to light that Jane had given certain patients the wrong doses of their medication. and. She had been falsifying records. To avoid any serious trouble, Jane left the hospital and eventually went into private practice or private nursing. It did not take Jane long to become a distinguished private nurse and her weekly salary climbed from $7 to $25. She received excellent re recommendations from doctors. Um, wealthy patients wanted her services because they wanted this jovial plump woman who appeared to care deeply about her patients taking care of them. There were only a few troubling reports um, regarding her care. Some patients reported that she would steal money or items from their homes or borrow money and never pay them back. Some patients claimed that she liked to tell little white lies, something that she had done since she was a child. In spite of all of the negative, like negative um, comments, people were willing to overlook them just to have them her care for them. She ended up befriending her elderly neighbor and his wife, but killed them one by one, explaining that they got feeble and fussy, old and cranky. Her colleagues in nursing school do remember her making a comment that no old people should be kept alive. In 1889, a seven-year-old woman by the name of uh, Mary McClear fell ill and um, she, her doctor sent Jane to come care for her. Jane ended up poisoning her. Elizabeth Brigham, you remember her, that is Jane's foster sister, adopted sister, however you want to put it. Jane would often visit Elizabeth at the home that they grew up in. And while Jane was vacationing in Buzzards Bay, 
1889 or 1899, she then targeted her sister. So Elizabeth complained of depression and Jane invited her down to um, the Cape. One day she took Elizabeth to the beach um, for a nice little picnic. She made some corned beef, she brought taffy. She also brought mineral water laced with strychnine. Jane later mentioned that she held her sister in her arms and watched with delight her taking her last breath. Jane then insinuated herself into Elizabeth's home where Elizabeth's husband lived because Jane wanted to marry the husband. Within three days, she had managed to poison their maid and kind of step into the maid's position of taking care of the home and of um, the brother-in-law. The brother-in-law, however, was having none of this. Like he, no, 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 no. I don't know what you're trying to pull, but no, you are not staying here. I do not want you. I do not like you. I do not love you. Get the heck out of my house. She even went as far as to threaten him that she would tell everyone she was pregnant. I mean, she just was Looney Tune. So he got her to leave. Like she left and luckily he was still alive when she left. She did not do anything more to this man. By 1901, a Massachusetts state detective was following Jane around. He suspected her of killing an entire family, the family of Alden Davis. Jane had rented a cottage in, um, from the Davis family, but she had never kept up the rent. When Alden Davis's wife, Maddie, came to collect the you know money that was owed to them, she, Jane ended up killing her with a morphine cocktail. She then moved in with the elderly Alden Davis to take care of him. So, you know, she took care of him all right. She ended up killing him and two of his married daughters, Minnie Gibbs and Geraldine Gordon. Minnie's father-in-law suspected the sudden deaths of an entire family to do with foul play, which, you know, I had every right to think that because that is exactly what happened. He requested that Minnie's body be exhumed and then a toxicology report be done on the body. The investigation revealed that she died of a morphine and atramine cocktail. Police arrested Jane um, in October of 1901. She went to trial for murder in the summer of 1902. She confessed to her lawyer that she killed 31 people, perhaps as many as 100. She claimed she started her killing spree because a boyfriend dumped her when she was 16. She stated that if she had been a married woman, she probably wouldn't have killed all those people. She'd be, she would have a husband, have children, and have a home to take care of that would take her mind off of these dark thoughts that she had. An eight hour trial took place and a jury took 27 minutes to deliberate and they found her not guilty by reason of insanity. She was sentenced to spend the rest of her life at the Taunton State Hospital in Massachusetts. While at the hospital, it was reported that she would often taunt the other nurses saying, get the morphine, dearie, and we'll go out into the ward. You and I will have a lot of fun seeing everybody die. There was no way to repair Jane's damaged mind. She lacked total empathy for the people that she murdered. She was in her 80s when she died in 1938. So there is the story of Jolly Jane, AKA the Angel of Death. I hope you guys enjoyed today's story time and makeup. If you did, give it a thumbs up and remember to hit that subscribe button down below if you haven't already, as well as the notification bell next to it to be notified of all of my upcoming videos. Thank you so much and I'll see you again soon. Bye.